Hello, my name is Chelsea Fitzgerald with James Care for Life. Welcome to Healthy Eating for the Cancer Survivor. In today's program, you will hear an introduction to a plant-based diet for cancer survivors. It's my pleasure to introduce our presenter, Candace Schreiber, is a James Care for Life outpatient dietitian that works to develop educational nutrition programs for cancer survivors, including caregivers, at the Ohio State University Comprehensive Cancer Center, Arthur D. James, and Richard J. Solov Research Institute. I will turn it over to our presenter. Thank you. Hello, and welcome to Healthy Eating for the Cancer Survivor. So today we'll be talking about um, just ba the basics of healthy eating while having a cancer diagnosis and for survivorship. The objectives that we're going to be going over today, we have quite a few today. Um, lots of things to go over, so we'll try and get through everything um, timely. We're going to be talking about why nutrition is important. We'll be talking about survivorship guidelines. The New American Plate, which is a a design of what you want to try and get your plate at home to look like for a healthy diet for a cancer survivor. We'll talk about what plant-based eating means and why it's important. We'll be identifying different sources of macronutrients, which are your protein, your carbohydrates, and your fat. We'll talk about learning how to build a healthy meal, and hopefully you will um, have the tools to build a healthy meal for yourself and understand the importance of meal planning, which includes shopping and cooking tips as well. And those will just be brief, um, just to give you just a few ideas for different sh shopping and cooking tips. So why is nutrition important? Well, as cancer survivors, you're at a greater risk for developing other health conditions, many that can be combated through diet and exercise. And we now have studies that show us that about a third of cancers, 33%, can be prevented through modifiable behaviors. And these behaviors are diet and exercise. Um, we, there's a lot of unmodifiable behaviors out there that can increase our risk for cancer, such as the environment and genetics. However, we really want to focus on these modifiable things that we can do every day to help prevent our risk of cancer, as well as our reoccurrence, along with other health conditions. And really, nutrition impacts every function of our body. And optimizing our nutrition can help food work for us instead of against us. So every time we eat something, it's either going to nourish our bodies, um, provide us with essential nutrients, as well as beneficial chemicals that improve the function of our body, or when we choose to eat things that aren't as healthy, it does work against our bodies, such as high fat, highly processed foods. These things work against our bodies, and we want to really eat more things that work with our bodies instead of against them. And so hopefully you'll have the tools to find and identify foods that help your body work better. So the American Institute for Cancer Research, they're the ones that provide these guidelines. They are really the organization that has extensively researched the link between diet and cancer. Um, they have reviewed thousands and thousands of studies. They have this expert panel. Um, and these 10 recommendations are what we are seeing from studies over and over again um, that the things that we can do can decrease our risk for cancer. It's not just one or two studies that we see, it's thousands of studies that we're seeing. Um, and these 10 recommendations, if you follow them, can help prevent cancer and prevent recurrence. It's not to say that if you follow all 10 guidelines, you won't get cancer or you won't have a reoccurrence. It's just stacking the odds in your favor. Um, so we'll kind of talk about these, these guidelines. And following these guidelines, about a third of cancers can be prevented. So not only did they research what the guidelines should be, they have also done studies to show if you follow these guidelines, your risk of cancer and recurrence goes down the more guidelines you follow. So the first guideline, be as lean as possible without becoming underweight. This is um, pretty pretty, a pretty big guideline. The AICR has identified that behind smoking, being a healthy body weight is the number one thing you can do to protect you from a cancer diagnosis and from a cancer recurrence. Um, there has been identified 11 cancers associated with being obese and overweight. Um, 
we're seeing more and more correlations between our weight and cancer. And so it's really important to try and become a healthy weight. And if you're not, any kind of weight loss, um, even if it's a small amount, is beneficial. And I always like to point out that even preventing weight gain is important as well. If you're somebody that is struggling with weight loss, remember that just not gaining weight is um, a goal in itself and um, a, a good thing to, to go to shoot for. Be physically active for at least 30 minutes every day. And this doesn't have to be 30 minutes all at one time. It could be spread out throughout the day, five minutes or 10 minutes here and there. And we now see that there's about 13 cancers that are associated with physical activity. So, um, which means through studies, we're seeing that physical activity can decrease the risk of 13, cancer, 13 different cancers. So again, a strong correlation with being physically active and being physically active throughout your day, taking the stairs, parking far away, things that you can incorporate um, just in your daily routine that are very important um, and that do correlate with your cancer risk. Avoiding sugary drinks and limiting consumption of energy dense foods. So these foods are highly processed. Um, they may have a lot of calories, a lot of sugar, but really little nutritional value. Um, so sugary drinks are, are a common one that is a good description of this. They have a lot of calories, a lot of sugar, but really no nutritional value at all. And we'll kind of dive a little bit more into these guidelines. The eat a variety of vegetables, fruits, whole grains, legumes, such as beans, and we'll really focus on this guideline a little bit more further in the presentation. Limit consumption of red meats, and this is beef, pork, and lamb. And I always like to point out pork because I think a lot of people think pork is a white meat. They have a great marketing campaign, but pork is not a white meat, it is a red meat, so it's important to um, consider that when you're trying to limit your red meats. And avoiding processed meat. So processed meat is anything that is smoked or cured or any kind of preservation that's done to the food through salting or curing or anything like that. Um, so your deli meats, sausage, bacon, those kinds of foods. If you do consume alcohol, limit it to two drinks a day for men and one drink a day for women. Um, there is a correlation between increased risk of cancer with um, heavy drinking. Limit consumption of salty foods and foods processed with salt. Um, a high salt diet can increase our risk for stomach cancer, so it's important to kind of keep the salt intake to a minimum. And then do not rely on supplements to protect against cancer. Now this. Guideline is not saying you should not take a supplement. If your doctor has prescribed one, definitely take it as directed. This is just saying don't choose to take a, a multivitamin supplement, for example, instead of eating your fruits and vegetables to get your, your vitamins. We always want the food to be the main source of nutrients. Um, and then if a supplement is needed for various reasons, then that's OK to take that as well. And then always remember not to use tobacco. So these are the guidelines that come from the AICR that Everyone should try and follow, whether you're a cancer survivor, a caregiver, um, never been diagnosed, whatever it might be. Um, these are the important guidelines that we want to follow, and following as many of them as possible. As I mentioned before, the more you follow, the decreased risk for cancer and recurrence there is. So a plant-based diet. We're going to really dive into what a plant-based diet means. As a cancer survivor, a plant-based diet is what we recommend as a type of diet to follow. What is a plant-based diet? If you go on the internet and search what is plant-based diet or just plant-based diet, you'll get a range of things because there's no standard definition of what a plant-based diet is. You may see it's a vegan diet. You may see it's a vegetarian diet. But I'm not talking about a vegan or vegetarian diet. I'm not saying you have to cut out all animal products. I'm talking more about a plant-heavy diet. Might be a better term used for it. But this is a eating pattern that really emphasizes those fruits, vegetables, beans, whole grains, nuts, and seeds, those types of foods, these plant foods. And choosing foods that is close to their natural state as possible. So when you're consuming foods and choosing foods at the grocery store, trying to get them to look like they've been freshly picked or um, grown outside as close to that natural state as possible. I often use the example of choosing an apple over an apple-flavored granola bar is eating foods close to their natural state. And as I mentioned, I'm not talking about a vegan or vegetarian. I'm not saying that you can never have animal products. They're, they should just be consumed in lesser amounts than your plant-based foods. And according to the AICR, again, a diet filled with these plant foods helps reduce risk for cancer and recurrence. And again, that's 
why we emphasize this plant-based diet. It also provides the essential nutrients your body needs, so vitamins, minerals, as well as fiber. Animal products do provide vitamins and minerals, but they do not have any fiber. And most of us don't get enough fiber in our diets. The average American gets right around 15 grams, when we really should be getting about 25 to 35 grams every day. And these come from these plant foods. They're also nutrient dense. Again, they have a lot of vitamins and minerals and relatively little calories and relatively little fat. Um, so the example that I use here, one cup of broccoli has lots of vitamins and minerals as well as phytochemicals, but it only has about 30 calories per cup if you're not um, putting anything on it before you put anything on it. So it's very, very small in calories and really nutrient, nutrient dense. It contains phytochemicals, and we'll talk more about phytochemicals in the next slides, and we'll kind of talk about what those are and why they're important. And not only can it reduce your risk for cancer and recurrence, it can reduce your risk of high blood pressure, diabetes, heart disease, and obesity. Again, these foods are naturally lower in calories and fat. They're going to help you control your weight better or lead to weight loss if that's what you're trying. They're naturally low in sugar, so that could help with diabetes or if you have prediabetes. Heart disease, they're low in fat. Whole plant-based foods virtually have no sodium if you don't add anything to them. Um, and so they're going to have, they're going to help with that hypertension and high blood pressure. And they maintain a healthy digestive system. Again, that comes from their fiber. There's a lot of research we're seeing um, come about and how important it is for your, to have good gut health. Um, fiber can, uh, good, having enough fiber in your diet can reduce your risk for colorectal cancer. And health, having a healthy digestive system with enough fiber can actually improve your immune system, we're seeing from some studies. So it's really important to get those nutrients from these plant foods. Again, animal foods just don't have the fiber that we need. So phytochemicals, as I mentioned, this is another important thing about plants. Phytochemicals aren't in any animal products, so you have to get these from plants. And these are natural compounds. They give the plants their smell um, so that when you cut into an onion or you smash garlic, that really potent smell, that comes from their phytochemicals. Their color, that bright red in um, tomatoes or the bright purple and eggplant, those all come again from its phytochemicals. The smell, the texture, the taste of them, these come from these compounds. And what these phytochemicals do for the plant is they strengthen their immune system when they're growing outside to protect them from the environment and from pests. And when we eat them, we can possibly get the benefits as well that can strengthen our immune systems and prevent cancer. There have been several thousand phytochemicals identified, and I'll kind of touch on a few in the next few slides just to kind of give you an idea. Um, you may have heard of some. And one serving of fruit and vegetables can have lots and lots of different phytochemicals. Again, this is why we recommend food before supplements. When you have one cup of vegetables, you're getting lots of vitamins, lots of minerals, and lots of phytochemicals. Versus a supplement, you're just getting that one supplement. And also color is a big thing. Like I said, the color um, represents different phytochemicals. So the more color, colors you get in your diet, the more phytochemicals you're getting. And we're also seeing from some studies that these phytochemicals work synergistically. So um, one phytochemical can increase the absorption of another phytochemical. For example, um, in turmeric, the active phytochemical curcumin is enhanced in our bodies by combining it with black pepper. So these two kind of phytochemicals work together to enhance the absorption and give our bodies the best benefits. So eating lots of colors, eating lots of different plant foods is what's really important. And again, studied for their ability to reduce risk of cancer and other diseases. So these are just some different phytochemicals um, that you may or may not have heard of. Carotenoids, these are in oranges, carrots, sweet potatoes, lots of other foods as well. Um, and there's actually some studies that have looked at the relationship between carotenoids and breast cancer, and they saw that the higher blood levels of carotenoids, the lower risk for certain breast cancers. Lycopene in tomatoes, lycopene has been studied for its role in prostate health, possibly reducing risk of prostate cancer. Um, indoles, broccoli, cabbage, turnips, polyphenols, 
which are flavonoids and lots of your berries, apples, eggplant, those types of foods. So lots of different phytochemicals and different plant foods. And again, getting these foods from whole foods, not supplements. So you want to consume a variety of these foods instead of taking a garlic supplement or a lycopene supplement. We're not really sure if those are beneficial or even if they're safe, especially if you're in cancer treatment. Um, you definitely want to avoid those types of supplements if you're in treatment. Um, but getting those nutrients from the food is what's important. Trying to get at the very minimum five, at least five servings a day. We really want to see more than that, maybe seven to ten servings a day if possible. Um, and because th the more the better, really. Uh, these foods are so wonderful for us that the more we eat of them, the better, especially vegetables. Um, and I kind of just gave you an idea of what one serving looks like. So for fruit, about one medium-sized piece of fruit or a half cup. And vegetables, one cup raw versus a half cup cooked um, it is typically a serving. So try and add these into your diet as much as possible. And this is just a, tar a chart, just to kind of, if, if you're interested at all, I know it's a lot, very wordy, um, but just if you're interested in the different, some of the different phytochemicals, their plant source, I had mentioned, um, there's lots of different sources of each phytochemical. And then what their possible benefits might be. So as you can see in a lot of these, inhibit cancer cell growth, um, inhibit inflammation, improve immunity. You'll see a lot of that throughout the different possible benefits. And again, these are preliminary studies. A lot of them are cell studies or animal studies um, that we're seeing. So still in the research phase, but we're, we are seeing a lot of promise and, and things that, again, we can do just to stack the odds in our favor, um, eating these wonderful foods. And so this is really why we recommend this plant-based diet and getting a lot of these foods in and getting a variety of these foods. The new American plate. Um, so this is a, um, was developed by the AICR and just to kind of give people more of a visual of what a plant-based diet looks like. If you're not really into measuring cups and measuring spoons, you can kind of just look at your plate and then determine what a plant-based diet might look like um, from there. So this is kind of an idea of that. Um, so on the left, you have standard American diet. Most of that plate is meat, red meat, um, and a very, very small amount of vegetables, green vegetables. It's not very colorful. Um, and so we really want to move from that type of plate to the other plate, which is much more colorful. The meat is a much smaller portion. It's kind of not the starring role in this dish. You can see lots of different grains, lots of different vegetables, lots of different colors. This is really what we want to move towards, getting a colorful plate, getting less meat, um, and getting these plant foods to be the majority of our plate. So what we recommend is half of your plate at every meal being vegetables and fruit. <clears throat> so when you're preparing your lunches and your dinners, kind of visualize what your meal, what your plate looks like, and half of it should be vegetables. This chart just gives you just some ideas of what um, those examples might be. Again, it's not a comprehensive list by any means. Definitely want to get more variety than that. But it's just to give you an idea, um, maybe half of your plate being broccoli and cauliflower with some a fourth of your plate being some brown rice, maybe a quarter being some salmon. Um, just making sure half of that plate is some type of vegetable. And I always encourage people to maybe choose two vegetables. Um, so you have some more variety and more color in there. And lunch as well, as you can see, the one plate is a sandwich. You get some fruit and some veggies, again, making half that meal those foods. So protein, we encourage you to eat more plant protein. This is really important. Plant protein um, is still a great source of protein. And I, I it's all very common for people to assume meat equals protein, um, but there's lots of other sources of protein out there that we want to get. Um, legumes are w one of the best sources of plant-based protein. Your beans, your peas, lentils, and peanuts, these provide a great amount of protein, um, and they're plant-based. They also provide a lot of fiber and a lot of vitamins and minerals. Nuts and seeds, all nuts are good, all seeds are good. They vary a little bit in their nutritional profile, um, but 
for the most part, they're all good. You don't have to pick one or over the other, whatever kind of nuts and seeds that you like. Soy foods, um, tofu, edamame, tempeh, these are all good foods to include as well. Uh, half a cup of edamame has about 12 to 14 grams of protein. So that right there is a good source in just a half a cup of beans. And then encouraging you to try one meat-free day a week. So for example, if you normally have ground beef tacos for dinner, maybe doing black bean tacos instead of the ground beef, or at least doing half beef, half black bean tacos might be a way to get more plants in there and less meat. If you normally put chicken on your salad, maybe putting some chickpeas on your salad instead of chicken. Um, or again, half chickpeas, half chicken um, to increase that plant-based protein. Fish, poultry, low-fat dairy, as I mentioned before, this isn't a vegetarian or vegan diet, so you can definitely include those things in the diet. Fish is, has a lot of great nutrients, so I definitely encourage you to, um, to, to eat it frequently, um, once a week, maybe twice a week. <clears throat> no more than 18 ounces of red meat per week. And 18 ounces is what we're seeing from the AICR through studies, that anything more than 18 ounces per week can increase our risk for colorectal cancer. So kind of keeping that to a minimum. And again, that's beef, pork, and lamb. Avoiding processed meats, as I mentioned in the beginning, anything cured or smoked or salted, sausage, bacon, hot dogs, bratwurst, even deli meats. I know turkey and, and chicken um, are leaner, so they have less fat. Um, but these are still highly processed with salt. And so we want to keep those to a minimum. I often get asked about the uncured products that are out there <clears throat> excuse me, nowadays. And unfortunately, these things haven't been around long enough. And even though they aren't cured using the chemicals nitrates, nitrites, um, they still are cured some way, whether it's through celery powder or salt. Um, they're still processed. And so you still um, want to minimize these as much as possible. Not saying you can never have them. Certainly can have a turkey sandwich every now and then. Just don't make it an everyday habit. And limit charring meats on the grill. When you cook meats at really high temperatures or if they fall into coals, um, they produce carcinogenic compounds. So we want to keep charring meats on the grill to a minimum. Again, never saying you can't barbecue or grill out. It certainly can do that on occasion, just not frequently. So carbohydrates. So there's different kinds of carbohydrates. Um, and I know sometimes people look at carbohydrates as being something that they want to avoid if they're trying to lose weight. But it, it's really more the type of carbohydrates we eat than the carbohydrates themselves that are the problem. So simple carbohydrates, these are just simple sugars. They're broken down, digested very easily, very quickly in the body. Um, and, and most of them are, aren't really healthy, simple carbohydrates. Again, they're processed so quickly, they typically don't have as much fiber in them, less nutrients. However, there are exceptions. Milk and fruit are simple, but they do provide a lot of nutrients for us, and fruit provides some fiber for us. So these are good, simple sugars, but most out there are not um, the best for us. Complex carbohydrates are really where we want to get our whole grains um, from. And so these are starchy foods. They have more vitamins, more minerals the antioxidants and the fiber. And they take longer to digest, so they keep us fuller for longer. And so we really want to focus on these complex carbohydrates instead of the simple ones. So what are complex carbohydrates? Well, these are your whole grains. This is why dietitians often say, eat your whole grains, eat your whole grains, because they have so many great nutrients in them, way more than your refined grains. So what are whole grains? So whole grain bread, <clears throat> whole grain pasta, couscous, quinoa, farro, oatmeal, corn, barley, brown rice. There's lots of other ones out there. The term ancient grains has gotten a, a big buzz lately, and a lot of grocery stores are now carrying um, bulk bins with these ancient grains. Um, and these are all great things to include. They all have a little bit different taste to them, so I encourage you to kind of try different ones. Um, but these are all great things to include in our diet that provide a lot of nutrients for us. And again, your simple carbohydrates, your white flour, white breads, and things made with white flour, cereals with refined flour, most of your baked goods, pastries, chips, pretzels, cookies, um, crackers, candy, soda, those types of things. These are all foods that 
are processed very quickly in the body, often don't provide as many nutrients. So we want to eat more of the complex. Again, you don't have to cut out simple carbohydrates altogether. It's certainly OK to have some of these foods every now and again. We just want the day-to-day -day things that you're eating to be mostly whole grains. So changing from white bread to whole grain bread, changing from white pasta to whole grain pasta. <clears throat> and you can even do this in stages. Sometimes when I talk to people, they just don't like the taste of whole grain pasta. So I tell them to do half white pasta and half whole grain pasta. Um, that way you're still getting in um, that whole grains and a lot of those nutrients. Um, but you, you still get the taste of that white pasta that, that you like better. So just different things you can do. And then maybe move to incorporating whole, all of whole grain pasta in your diet. <clears throat> So this slide just is one of the things I like to talk about, about reading your ingredients list. Um, this is from two different products that I saw at the grocery store, and both of them said whole wheat crackers on the label. The first one, as you can see, whole grain really isn't listed until farther down in the ingredients list. The very first ingredient is enriched flour. This is not whole grain flour. This is white flour. Um, and so while the front of the package says these are whole wheat, Sure, they may have some whole wheat in them, but they're by no means 100% whole wheat. And actually, they're more white flour than they are whole grain flour. Um, so I encourage you, when you're looking for whole grains, to look at your package. Um, this is especially true with breads. Um, there's lots of breads out there, and a lot of them are marketed as wheat bread or multigrain bread, but they don't really contain much whole grains. So when you're looking at these products, make sure the very first ingredient is whole wheat flour or whole grain flour. That's the most important thing. You can also see on the left, I mean, you may look at the box and think, whole wheat, oh, these are a healthy thing to, to have. Um, but not only are they mostly enriched, refined flour, they also have partially hydrogenated cottonseed oil that I put it, that I bolded in there. Um, and the this is trans fat, something that we want to completely avoid in the diet if possible. So just read your ingredients list when you're looking for these whole grain foods. And the other one that I saw, the whole wheat crackers on the other side with the small ingredients list, as you can see, that first ingredient is whole wheat, and that's what we want to look for when we're buying whole grain products. So for fats, these are another thing that's really important in the diet. However, we do want to eat them in moderation. They have more calories per gram than any other nutrients, and so that's why we need less of them. And fats aren't bad. Again, it's the type of fat that we eat that's what's important versus the total amount of fat. So saturated fats, these come mainly from your animal products, um, so meat, cheese, dairy, butter. And we really want to limit this type of fat. Um, there's a lot of different research on saturated fats and whether they increase risk for heart disease, whether they don't. Um, that's kind of been back and forth lately, but we do know that Saturated fats can contain more calories, um, and so this can cause struggle when we're trying to maintain a healthy weight as well. So we really want to try and limit these fats. Unsaturated fats is really what, where we want to focus. So our monounsaturated, avocados, nuts, seeds, olive oil, we want to get more of these, as well as our omega-3 fats, so your fish, especially your salmon, which is probably one of the most common fatty fish with those omega-3s. <clears throat> Walnuts, canola oil, and flaxseed. Chia seeds are another example of omega-3 fats. And again, we need to get more of these in our diets. And the other kind of unsaturated fat is omega-6s, corn, cottonseed, soybean oils. I did, excuse me, I didn't put get more in on, right next to the omega-6s because most of us get enough of these in our diet. These three oils are very, very prominent in processed food. So we get plenty, plenty of these. What we don't get enough of is the omega-3s and the monounsaturated. So we want to focus on getting more of those and including those in our diet on a regular daily basis. Maybe adding flaxseed to your morning oatmeal or cereal or smoothies or chia seeds. Um, adding avocado to your salad, things you can do to kind of incorporate these healthy fats into your diet. Again, <clears throat> your avocados, your nuts, um, these all have phytochemicals in them and these are a great plant food to, to consume. So your vitamins and minerals, again, they're essential for proper health. Um, they're involved in many, many, many processes in the body, and they are most abundant in plant foods. Just another reason why we recommend these types of foods. And getting these nutrients from diet is, is very important. Um, 
And so this new American plate, this healthier style of eating, um, really just the main picture here is making half of your plate vegetables, fruits, a quarter of it whole grains, and a quarter of it lean meat or plant-based protein. Um, that, that's the, really the main focus of this new American plate and what we encourage you to do um, to get the most nutrients, the most phytochemicals, to decrease risk for cancer and recurrence as well. Um, so pay attention to your plate, pay attention to your meals, and really try to adapt the style of eating and what your plate should look like. So now we'll be talking about building a healthy meal. So we really want to give you the tools to learn how to meal plan and create a healthy meal for yourself and for your families. So these are just some ideas. Um, again, not a comprehensive list, but just ideas to give you for each meal, some things you can kind of stem from to, to create your own meals and to meal plan. So for breakfast, consuming more eggs, oatmeal, whole grain cereals. Um, and for the whole grain cereals, look for things like whole wheat, whole grain, corn. If, it, if it's a mainly corn cereal, that's a whole grain, so that's good. Um, homemade smoothies. And I, I put homemade in there because smoothies at restaurants tend to have a lot of sugar in them. Um, so I encourage you to make your smoothies at home whole wheat bread, low-fat dairy, vegetables, and fruit. For vegetables, I know it's not as common to consume vegetables at breakfast, but maybe if you're making an omelet or making a frittata or something along those lines, you can add in some peppers and onions and mushrooms, um, and broccoli, spinach, those types of things. And then consuming less of your sugary cereals. So really look at your ingredients list on your cereals um, and make sure sugar isn't listed in, in the top three ingredients. Um, that means that it's going to have more sugar in it um, when it's in the, the top of that ingredients list. White bread, white bagels, sausage, bacon, muffins, donuts. These are, again, high sugary, highly processed foods that provide little nutrients for us. Um, so these are under consume less. Again, not completely avoid, but just consume less of these. You don't want to make a regular stop at um, a restaurant for a donut in the morning regular party routine. You want it to be a very, very occasional thing. Lunch and dinner, consuming more salads. And when I say salads, this doesn't have to be a lettuce salad or a leafy green salad every day. If you get bored of that, it could be a broccoli salad or a green bean salad or kind of change things around so you're not getting bored. Broth-based soups, quinoa, brown rice, again, your whole grains. Potatoes are great, white or sweet. Beans, any kind of bean, black beans, pinto beans, kidney beans, chickpeas, these are all <clears throat> different beans that are a great source of protein. Whole wheat pasta, low-fat dairy, again, vegetables, making vegetables half of that meal, half of that plate, fruits, nuts, and seeds. Also, um, making sure a quarter of your plate, if you want meat, to make it lean, skinless, poultry, skinless fish, those types of things. And then consuming less red meat, white rice, white pasta, pre-made meals, anything that's highly processed with a long ingredients list. For snacks, consuming more fruits and vegetables. Um, so maybe if you have a bag of chips for a snack, maybe changing to some raw vegetables with a dip, hummus, or ranch dressing consuming some fruit, nuts, seeds, low-fat dairy, string cheese is a good option. Consuming less, I say most granola bars, I didn't say all because there are some granola bars that are a little bit better out there, but a lot of granola bars have as much sugar as a candy bar and, and little nutrition. So it, they are very convenient and, and useful and um, good to kind of keep once in a while, but just make sure you, again, you pay attention to your ingredients list look for less sugar, look for a small ingredients list is what I encourage from granola bars. Um, consuming less chips, pastries, ice cream, full fat dairy, those types of things. For beverages, consuming more water on unsweet tea. Um, tea has a lot of phytochemicals and there's some good research on green tea and the catechins, which is one of their phytochemicals um, and, and the benefits it has with decreasing risk for cancer. So drink your teas but consume less, mostly all your sugary drinks, so, but that, and that includes sweet tea. You want to drink unsweet tea or lightly sweetened tea. 
juice, soda, energy drinks, sports drinks, those types of things, all that's sweetened with sugar. That provides little nutrition for us. So this is just a sample of what a day may look like. This is not a specific calorie or protein content. Um, this is just, just to give you an idea of what a plant-based with a variety of different nutrients looks like. So for breakfast, scrambled eggs with some vegetables, whole wheat toast with some butter and strawberries. For lunch, this is like a black bean salad with various vegetables to it, making your own dressing, from olive oil, lemon juice, and vinegar, and then finishing it off with an apple and peanut butter. And then for dinner, having a small amount, again, one-fourth of the plate being lean meat, skinless chicken, um, half of that plate being roasted broccoli and cauliflower, with a and then a quarter of it being a brown rice or a whole grain or whatever it might be. Um, these, this is just kind of an example I wanted to provide to give you what a day might look like. Snacks, these are just, again, some ideas for healthy snacks that you can have. Um, if you're somebody that likes to snack between your meals or in the evening. And a lot of these snacks also have, I always encourage people to have a carbohydrate and a protein together with your snack. It'll help you feel fuller, um, longer, which is what a snack is meant to do. It's supposed to hold you over till your next meal. So you want something substantial, so a carbohydrate and a protein in there as well as some fiber if possible will really help you do that. Um, and again, getting if you can include a vegetable snack, raw veggies with dip or a fruit snack, um, a piece of fruit, not fruit snacks, a piece of fruit snack um, or whatever it might be. These are just some lists of examples of snacks. So for meal planning, Meal planning is really important, especially if you're trying to eat healthier. Um, it's really easy to kind of do things that are quicker, maybe stop at the drive through things that <clears throat> if you're busy that just function better in your day. But we really want to plan our meals. This will really save us time, save us money. We'll be more organized and we'll really improve our nutrition if we're really sitting down thinking about the quality of our diets. That's what's important. And so we want to do that. We want to make time to think about what we're putting in our bodies, what we're feeding our families as well. And so meal planning is really important. So I encourage you to take time to do this. And I'm just going to briefly touch on some ideas for meal planning. Think about, if you take a day to meal plan, think about what your week's going to look like. If you have days that you might work late or might be a little bit busier, you might want to do a quick slow cooker meal for that day or maybe leftovers or something much quicker um, versus another day that you might have more time and you might be able to do a little bit more in-depth of a recipe. So kind of think about your week. Check what's on sale at the store if you're looking to budget. And find healthy recipes. Look on the internet that has a wealth of healthy recipes and have somewhere to save them. You can have staples, things that you go to that are quick, that you know how to cook, that are fast. Um, you can also have theme nights. This is a great way if you don't really, it, it helps make meal planning faster. Um, Sunday in my house is pizza night every night, so I never have to think about Sunday night dinners. Um, we always make homemade pizza. So have these kind of theme nights, maybe Italian night or Mexican night, so it makes meal planning a little bit easier. And keep your recipes simple. Don't look at recipes or come up with recipes that take a long time or have crazy ingredients. Keep them simple. You're more likely to stick to meal planning if you have easy recipes. Um, and I am not one to come up with a recipe on my own, so I always have to have a template. So that's why I go online to look for my recipes and then I use an app on my phone to save the recipes and that's how I do my meal planning. You can sign up for websites for free, never pay for recipes because you really don't have to. There's lots of free healthy ones out there. And again, have somewhere to save them, whether it's an app on your phone or you print them out and put them in a folder, wherever it might be. Have somewhere to save them and then refer back to them when you are going to do your meal plan. And write it down. This will hold you more accountable. If you write it down, that way your family knows what you're having, you know what you're having, you remember what you're having. Um, and if you've bought everything from the grocery store that week, then you want to stick to that meal plan because you don't want those foods to go bad. Um, so write that down, whether it's in a notebook, maybe on a chalkboard, um, 
or somewhere that you can see it or your family can see it. That way you stick to that meal plan. So meal planning is really important when we're thinking about building a healthy meal, when we're trying to get a lot of those plant foods in. <clears throat> we don't want foods to go bad. We want to use those foods. Um, and so plan, prep, do what you need to do to make sure you're consuming those foods and getting those foods in every day. Shopping and cooking tips. So these are just very brief shopping and cooking tips that we're going to be talking about just to give you some ideas on shopping healthy and cooking healthy. So the number one thing I, I often tell people is shop what's, for what's in season. Buy things that are more in season, are fresher. They're oftentimes cheaper. They taste better. And when things are not in season, sometimes it's better to buy frozen or even canned. Um, and these often cost less. So these are a great option if you're looking to budget. There's nothing wrong with buying frozen or canned versions of fruits and vegetables. <clears throat> If you are buying frozen or canned, for canned, just make sure the fruits are packed in their own juices, lower in sodium is best for vegetables. You can also rinse them, and that'll decrease the sodium. Um, and making sure there's no kind of anything added to them, no gravies, no sauces, those types of things. Make sure it's just the vegetable or fruit. Shopping in the perimeter of the store, for the most part, um, I... This is a very, very common tip I think dietitians often get, but I think grocery store people are learning that we give this tip, and now they're putting unhealthy things in the aisles, which I've seen from doing grocery store tours. So the reason we say shop the perimeter is because typically that's where the fresh food is, um, things that your produce, your fresh meats, those types of things. So stick to those foods. The majority, look at your shopping cart the next time you go shopping. The majority of that shopping cart should be produce. So you definitely need to go between the aisles to get different cooking ingredients or different things that you prepare. Your whole grains are typically in the aisles. So you definitely need to use those, but try not to go down every aisle. Um, try not to go down specific aisles that you know might trigger you to buy things that aren't as healthy. Um, so really try and stick to that produce section and, and spend the most time there. And as I um, often talk about is being familiar with your ingredients list. Um, I can't stress that enough. Know what's in your food. Um, this is so important. Next time you're in the kitchen, go in your pantry, or next time you're at the grocery store, just take a, a glance at your ingredients list. Things that you might think are healthier might not be. And, and the best kind of foods actually don't have an ingredients list because they're produce. So think about that. But when you're in the aisles, take a look. And you don't have to do this for every single food, but maybe things that you buy every single week, things that you and your family are consuming on a very regular basis. Look at those ingredients list. The smaller, the better. The more whole foods, the better for your ingredients list. And again, the best foods don't even have one because they're fresh produce. So these are just some foods that are in season, just to give you an idea. You can also internet search what's in season in your area. So spring, summer, fall, winter, and then year round. But again, you, the nice thing about grocery stores nowadays is you can find these foods all year round for the most part. Um, they might not be what's in season, but you certainly can find them. And any plant food, it's good to have whether it's in season or not. We just really encourage you to, to eat with the seasons. So some shopping and cooking tips for vegetables. My favorite way to tell people to cook vegetables is either to saute or roast them. This really brings out the natural sugars in vegetables and the wonderful flavors they have. And cooking with a small amount of fat, this will enhance the absorption of a lot of the phytochemicals. Lycopene, for example, in tomatoes is enhanced when you pair it with a healthy fat. You don't need a lot of fat, just about a teaspoon of oil. Um, so you don't need to slather it in butter or oil or anything, just a little bit of fat will work. Uh, cooking in minimal liquid, this will help reduce any kind of nutrient loss. So unless you're making a soup or a stew where you're consuming the liquid, I often encourage people to um, cook things without a lot of liquid in them. So saute, roast, steam is another good option. <clears throat> cooking a short time, uh, some of those nutrients are lost when you cook food for longer, so cooking them as quick as possible. I would say till they're about crisp, tender crisp is a, is a good kind of standard to go by. Using your spices, garlic, rosemary, thyme, curry, turmeric, paprika, these are all 
wonderful spices, and spices actually have a lot of phytochemicals in them and a lot of good nutrients. Um, so these are definitely things we want to add. They're not just great for flavor, they're also healthy for our bodies. Um, and this will help you use less salt too when you use a lot of these. And avoiding cream sauces and any kind of thick gravies. <clears throat> For grains and starches, choosing your whole grains, again, brown rice, quinoa, barley, whole wheat pasta, just a few examples. And what I like to do is add flavor by using a low-sodium chicken or vegetable broth instead of water. I think this provides a little bit, um, it has more flavor to it when you're cooking with that. And I like to point out the low-sodium, not the lower sodium. The lower sodium still has quite a bit. So look for that low-sodium versions of those foods and then add in some spices to that. Potatoes as well, those are a great source of nutrients. White potatoes as well as sweet potatoes have a lot of nutrients. Sweet potatoes slightly outweigh your white potatoes when we're looking at their nutritional profile, but white potatoes certainly have a lot of nutrients as well. Choosing whole potatoes instead of pre-made, so always go for that produce section, go for that whole, tomato, or whole potato instead of those boxed potatoes or pre-made packaged potatoes. And then choose your healthy toppings. <clears throat> Salsa is a great option. Low-fat cheese, even veggies, broccoli is a great option to add. You can do like a stuffed sweet potato with maybe some black beans and um, a little bit of cheese, a little bit of sour cream, a small amount of butter, but really kind of watching how much butter and sour cream you add and really filling up more on the veggies and the beans. So really, in summary, we're kind of talking about increasing your fruits and vegetables, making them half of your plate. <clears throat> so when you're shopping and when you're looking and meal planning, focus on those plant foods, focus on those fruits and vegetables and whole grains, beans, foods that look like they were grown outside, that are colorful. Try not to get into a rut of picking the same fruits and vegetables week after week after week. Make it a goal maybe to try one new fruit or vegetable every week or every month, whatever it might be, to kind of increase your intake of these wonderful foods. Avoiding processed meats and limiting red meats. And then choosing those complex whole grain starches that have those good nutrients, that good fiber instead of your simple carbohydrates. And try and plan your meals. Do as much meal planning as you can for better nutrition. And really looking at the big picture of your diet instead of focusing on maybe a single nutrient or I often get asked what, sup what superfoods are out there. Really, plants are your, sur your superfood, um, all of them, all your vegetables, your nuts, your beans, your fruits, those types of things. Focus on getting a variety of those. And then the little things you do every now and again if you have um, a high-fat diet or a high-fat meal or a donut here and there, or some ice cream here and there. That, that's really not going to affect your health risk if you're consistently choosing these plant-based foods and making them the majority of your diet. So I encourage you to adapt this plant-based style of living, not just a diet, something that you want to adapt for, a, for your whole life, really. And this can really, again, stack the odds in your favor, possibly reduce risk of cancer, recurrence, as well as a host of other diseases.